Hey guys, this is Nick and welcome to your weekly Linux and open source news video. This time around we have Linux developers being way faster at fixing bugs than their proprietary counterparts. We have Intel ramping up Linux support through acquisitions and we have some bad news for game support for the Steam Deck. Also, the channel celebrated its fourth birthday on Monday, so there's that. Just like there's this segue to today's sponsor, which is going to let you make sure that your internet connection isn't used for anything that you didn't want. This video is sponsored by Safing, and you might already have heard me talk about their port master tool on the channel. It lets you monitor and control any detail of your internet connection with a simple graphical user interface through the use of block lists, profiles, depending on your current connection, and per app settings. It's also completely free of charge and open source. But Safing is also developing the SPN, the Saving Privacy Network. It's a powerful VPN alternative which spreads your connections across the globe instead of rerouting all your connections to only one server. With the SPN, you can be everywhere at once. So just head over to the link in the description below and download either the Portmaster or subscribe to the SPN. Okay, let's begin. Google has been conducting something called Project Zero which aims to make it more difficult for bad actors to exploit and find vulnerabilities. They've been doing that for 10 years, and now they're sharing some interesting conclusions that paint developers for Linux in a very flattering light. It turns out that Linux developers fix their bugs extremely quickly compared to most other big companies. They fixed 96% of bugs that were reported in 2019 by the end of a 90-day period, with an average time to fix a bug of 25 days. If this seems high to you, Apple, to fix their bugs, took 69 days. Nice. Microsoft took 83 days, Google 44, Oracle 109. Of course, Linux developers received less bugs than Apple or Microsoft, at 25 bugs against respectively 84 and 80. Linux developers even improved their performance over 2022 and 2021, moving down to 22 and then 15 days to fix on average. Oracle, though, is clearly the ugly duckling here. Only 7 bugs reported in 2019 and 109 days to fix. Come on, Oracle, do something. Speaking of vulnerabilities, it looks like there was a vulnerability in the Snap package manager. A new privilege escalation vulnerability has been identified and since fixed. So if there's a SnapD update, you should do it. The flaw allowed a local attacker to gain root privileges by mounting their own content inside of the namespace snap users, and then calling to a specific function to run whatever code they want. This was discovered by the Qualys research team and dubbed the OSnap oh, More Lemmings vulnerability. Not gonna lie, that's a pretty cool name. Intel confirmed and detailed a timeline for their new discrete GPUs, all under the brand named Arc. The first ones for laptops should ship in the first quarter of 2022, so we should see them arriving pretty soon, and they should work alongside the new 12th gen Intel CPUs that launched recently. For the desktop, Intel says they won't be there until the second quarter, and workstation graphics will have to wait for the third. It makes sense, as Intel has almost always made laptop-level graphics and never desktop-class integrated chips. More competition in that space can only be good, I guess, they also announced a new project called Endgame, which seems to refer to a cloud GPU rental service. That Endgame project will probably snap into place really well with cloud gaming solutions. Intel is increasing their investment in Linux, and the latest move is their purchase of Linutronics. I didn't know about that company beforehand. It seems that they're based in Germany, and they are doing consulting work focused on embedded Linux and real-time computing. Intel probably bought that company for the talent, as their CTO is a prolific contributor to the x86 architecture for the Linux kernel, and has notably worked on the patches for mitigating CPU vulnerabilities. This probably means that Intel is looking to increase support for their hardware on the Linux kernel, which goes well with their plans to offer cloud-based GPU rental services. It's always a good thing to see big companies supporting the Linux kernel more. There was a nice blog post about inter-desktop standardization from Nicholas Fella. While working on the KDE task manager, they noticed that there was a new open new instance context menu action, even in cases where the application was not able to open a new instance, because the app is single window, for example. 
By digging into the issue, they noticed that GNOME had already fixed that on their part with a dedicated key specific to GNOME in the application's desktop file. Well, they decided that it was time to make that a standard. So they worked on exactly that, and the resultant thing is already implemented in GNOME and KDE. And you're gonna ask, why do I bother you with such small details? Well, it's, I think, a nice reminder that while we get embroiled in the desktop wars over which one is better, the developers for GNOME and KDE actually are working very well together to standardize a lot of things and make everything better for everyone. It's a nice reminder. It seems that the RiserFS file system might get booted off the Linux kernel. RiserFS was all the rage when I started using Linux. It was basically the better FS of the time. Turns out its creator was pretty unsavory and there hasn't been much work done on this file system in a while. Since no one wants to touch it, it's been left to rot and it looks like it will be on its way out in 2022. Since the kernel developers are making a few architectural changes that require work on RiserFS to complete, the options are to either update the old file system no one uses or to deprecate it. I mean, no one has been badgering me about RiserFS in the comments, contrary to BetterFS, so I guess it means RiserFS is no longer cool and no one will complain if it gets booted off, right? More KDE progress this week, with interesting new things that should arrive in Plasma 5.25 or in KDE Gear 22.04. First, the 15-minute bug initiative is progressing, with 82 bugs remaining in the list. Second, the Kate text editor has an interactive path bar that shows you the folder hierarchy of the file you're currently viewing, and that lets you switch to another file as well. Pretty handy. Color schemes will also get a boost in 5.25, with the option to apply the accent color to window title bars or the whole header area. And that would look super cool with just a bit of transparency. There are also plenty of smaller usability improvements like better notifications for the archive tool, touch-ups on the context menus, or new menu item to let users discover more actions thanks to K command bar, which is a pretty cool feature. One day I'll read all these blog posts and not want to return to KDE, but today is not that day. Ubuntu Touch received a new over-the-air update, OTA 22. It brings the beginnings of FM radio support to let supported devices listen to analog radio. This work allows an FM radio app to be developed and it should arrive in the App Store in the next few weeks. OTA 22 also implements WebGL support and the web browser now allows users to make video calls because it now supports the camera. Volaphone X users will also have fingerprint support and they are new full ports for the OnePlus 5 and the OnePlus 5T. Finally, it also adds rotation to the lock screen and autocomplete in the dialer to offer contacts numbered. While I couldn't use Ubuntu Touch as a daily driver just yet, seeing all these updates, however small they might seem, really makes me want to spend more time fiddling around with Linux phones. Valve explained in more detail how their game review process works for games on the Steam Deck. There was some confusion about certain titles that have a native Linux port, but that seemed to have been reviewed as running with Proton. Turns out this was unintentional, and these games have since been put back in the queue to be reviewed as native Linux ports. On top of that, they clarified the situation in their developer documentation, stating that the Linux build will be the one tested if available, and if it fails, then they will move on to testing the Windows build running with Proton and they will display the most favorable rating out of the two so users can have the best experience. This will probably annoy some people because it means that in some cases, Valve will recommend the Windows version running with Proton over the Linux native build. But it also means that Steam Deck users will have the best experience possible and these guys don't care about which version is running. The Linux Experiment, an illustrious YouTube channel dedicated to Linux and the Linux desktop, celebrated its fourth birthday on the 21st of February. Since the owner of that channel was too lazy to do anything, it wasn't celebrated in any way, apart from a podcast for patrons. So here it is, in all its late glory. The channel is now four years old, which means it's old enough to drink in certain countries. Probably. I mean, some countries probably let toddlers drink, right? In the past four years, I've published more than 400 videos, gained more than 150,000 subscribers, and made way less money than you'd expect. It was still a fantastic journey that I look forward to continuing for the next four years. After that, we'll have to reassess. Or not. You could already use the Check My Deck website, again, not to be mispronounced, to verify how much of your Steam library was certified by Valve to run on the Steam Deck. 
Well, Valve now has its own official tool that you can access using the link in the description below. On my library, we're up to 13 certified games, 27 playable ones, and 6 unplayable ones, including Halo MCC and Vermintide 2. Also, I don't know why they think Vampire the Masquerade is unplayable, because I distinctly remember playing it a bit on Linux. 175 games are untested yet. On top of that, we're now up to 720 games playable, or higher, including COD Infinite Warfare, Ark Survival Evolved, or Goat Simulator. Also, I might get a review unit of the Steam Deck, but since I have no answer on when it's gonna ship or if it's going to ship, I will definitely not be ready for reviewing it tomorrow, so I'll be late compared to everybody else, which means I'll have to make a way better review than everybody else. No pressure. Less good news though, as GOG won't support the Steam Deck officially. Currently, they do offer native Linux downloads that are only officially supported on a few versions of Ubuntu. They don't offer their launcher, GOG Galaxy, on Linux, and they don't plan to offer a way to easily access your games from GOG on the deck. They actually say that since the device is open, people could install Windows and also run their GOG games on it. Seriously, if you get a Steam Deck, do not install Windows on it. It's not going to be optimized for it, it's going to run terribly, I'd estimate you're gonna lose 10 to 25% of your performance by using that thing. Don't do it. Of course, I wouldn't be surprised if guides appeared online after the deck's release to help people install GOG Galaxy through Wine or Lutris from the desktop mode of the deck. I know I might make one. More sad Steam Deck news as Feral won't be updating their Linux ports for the Steam Deck. Feral is responsible for porting plenty of amazing titles to Linux, like the XCOM series, the Total War Warhammer series, Total War Three Kingdoms, Hitman, the Tomb Raider reboot series, Life is Strange, and a lot more. It seems that they're really contracted by companies to make a port, fix the issues, port the DLC, but that's it, as they won't be updating these ports specifically for the Steam Deck. They advise players that encounter issues to just use Proton and run the Windows version. And this is why I tend to personally just run the Windows version of every game through Proton instead of the Linux native build, because I get all the DLCs, all the updates, all the fixes at the same time as everyone else, and performance degradation is virtually non-existent anymore. So unless the Linux native build is really fantastic, I just don't see why you would use it. What I do see though is why you should check out today's sponsor, Slimbook. Slimbook is making Linux laptops and desktops from Valencia, Spain. They are great hardware that I exclusively use these days to run the channel. And they're letting you get 150 euros off the Slimbook Executive, which is their premium Ultrabook. Great screen, great keyboard, great magnesium chassis, good I.O. It's just a fantastic choice. And at 150 euros off, you really can't go wrong with that device. So I left a link to it in the description below with the offer code to use at checkout. Click it if you need a new laptop. It's really worth it. So thank you everyone for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't stay to like, subscribe, turn on notifications, and if you didn't, you can also dislike and tell me why in the comments. And if you really enjoy these Linux news videos, you can also become a patron or a YouTube member, both get access to a weekly patron cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. Check out the links in the description below to become one or the other. So thank you guys for watching the video, and I guess I'll see you in the next one. Bye!